it's a, you're. I don't. I already have it. I already have a copy. You won't see it. That's smart. Are we all ready? Um, um, you're fine. It doesn't say it. Church of God. Amen. How are we doing? Excellent. We alive? Yeah. We kicking? Yeah. We're not we're not tired and grouchy, are we? No. Come on. That's no way to that's no way to enter into the presence of God. Man, when you know God, you come running. You're excited. It doesn't matter what kind of day you had yesterday. It doesn't matter what kind of week you had. You're just like, whoa! We're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. Psalm 61 is one of my favorite psalms. It says, Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Man, did you know that God wants to take you higher than you're meant to go? Did you know without God, you can't ascend to that rock? Did you know you can have God in your life? You can be a Christian, but you can choose to not be led by him? Ooh, so where are you being led? Where are you being led? 
Today, uh, as, we, as we enter praise and worship, I just feel, uh, I just feel in my heart that some of us, uh, we're Christians, we follow God, we love him, but lately we haven't really been led by him. We've been being led by something else. And as we, as we continue to worship and as the band continues to play, uh, we're going to worship God. But I encourage some of you, make the choice when you lift your hands to be led by God. Because you know what? He's got your best intention in mind. He wants to lead you to the rock that is higher than you could ever obtain without him. Amen. Oh, okay. 
worship you today. Magnify your name. Exalt you. Just worship him with your own words. Father, you are good. Yes. Just thank him with your own words. Oh, you are good. Somehow good he is. You are mighty. Oh, you are good. Oh, your goodness. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Father God. Oh, we worship your name. You are mighty. You are holy. Oh, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah. You are so good. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we just worship your name for your goodness. Oh, hallelujah, Father God. Oh, yeah. hallelujah. Thank you, God. You are so good to us. You are good. Oh, glory to God. Oh, we worship your name. Hallelujah. Shakande shikita. Lomono shikito lora de tete. Hallelujah. 
Oh, we worship your name. Hallelujah. He's good. Oh, you are good. Some may say, I come in here and I've come in with baggage and I've come in with bills and I've come in with sickness. But what I would encourage you today with, just say God's good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when you can't change it yourself, just say God is good. Amen. And let him work on your behalf. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You are good. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated this morning, tell somebody God is good around you. Tell them how good he is. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. Right. God is good. I hope you told some people that God is good this morning. Amen? All right. All right. As you guys are making your way back to your seat after telling somebody God is good because he is. Amen? If you need an offering envelope, raise up your hand good and high. The ush ushers are in the aisles. And they are ready to give you that offering envelope this morning so you can have a chance to give. Amen? Amen. Speaking of God being good, you know, he is. Amen? I have a story for you this morning about Jesus being good. Amen? Jesus did some good stuff. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good in the book of Acts and healing all their oppressed of the devil. So if you want to get a good look at how God is good, look at Jesus. He went about doing good. Amen? Amen. It says in Luke chapter 9, there's a story about Jesus. He was taking him and his disciples, and they were going off to a desert place to take a little break. And it says in verse 11, it says, And when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who were in need of healing. We're talking about a good God, amen? That sounds like a good thing, amen? Jesus healing people. Verse 12 of Luke chapter 9. It says, When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away. Now that does not sound like God right there, does it? Send the multitude away. The Bible just said in the verse earlier that the, disciple, that the multitude came to Jesus and he received them, right? So sometimes, you know what? We're not always in sync with what Jesus is doing. Hello? Yeah. Have you ever found yourself in that place? All right. Send the multitude away. Uh, that's what they said. Okay. So let's read on. It says... Uh, Okay, when it began to wear away, the twelve said to him, Send a multitude away, that they may go to the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. Have you ever felt like your life is kind of a deserted or desert place? Well, that's what the disciples were realizing. Out here in this wilderness, we have a lot of needs. What they did not understand was the need meter was standing right next to them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right there. Right there. Right, like, like living with them. And they don't see him. All they see is this place is kind of a wasteland. You know what? This world is kind of a wasteland sometimes. But listen, man, who's standing next to you? Who's in your midst? Amen? The presence of God was there that day. And God is going to show them that he is the one that they need. He's it. Amen? It goes on to say here, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than just five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. So they're making up an excuse. 
Okay, verse 14. For there were about 5,000 men. You know, sometimes the need is great. But notice how Jesus received them. He didn't care how many there were. If there were 5, 10, 1, or 5,000, he received them. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so, and they made them all sit down. Then, the Bible says, he, Jesus, took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. I want to show you guys something really interesting here. My Bible has a little caption before this story, and it says, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Jesus did not feed anybody that day. The Bible just, I just read, Jesus prayed over the food, bless it, broke it, and gave it to them. The disciples actually fed the 5,000 that day. Jesus kicked back and watched. <laughs> yeah. When you obey Jesus, a miracle can be performed at your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, all he did was pray. He gave it to them, and the disciples gave it to the multitude. Verse 17. So when they ate, all ate, and were filled, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Two things I want you to notice here in this simple parable. Number one, when you obey Jesus, a miracle is about to happen through your hand. And number two, he will always take care of you. There were how many loaves? Five. How many fish? Two. There were 12 disciples, right? How many disciples were there? Uh -huh. How many baskets were taken up at the end? Uh -huh. I wonder who was holding those 12 baskets when they got done. I bet they were looking in those baskets and going, what did we just do? What just happened? The need meter not only took care of everyone there, he would made sure he took care of the disciples that day. Hallelujah. See, when you have the right heart in giving, and you obey Jesus and what he tells you to do in your giving, you will not only be a blessing to impact those around you, when you're all said and done, you're going to be in awe because you're going to have more than you ever started out with. And the Bible didn't even say that the five loaves and two fishes were theirs. But look at what they have. They have a whole basket to go home with. Hey, Mark, could you imagine the story when they got home that day? Check this out. Look what Jesus did. So I want to encourage you this morning. In your giving, obey Jesus. Do what he's asking you to do. Watch the miracle flow through your hand as you're a blessing to those around you. And when you're all said and done, you're going to be amazed that you have more than enough. Not only for you, but all your needs are met overly and abundantly in Jesus name. Father God this morning as we give we thank you that all of our needs are met because of Jesus and as we obey Jesus in our giving we thank you that his goodness and his grace is upon us. We just sang a wonderful song about how good you are and you are good to us every day and always. We thank you Lord for blessing us to be a blessing. We thank you for the needs of this church being met and we think that this church is impacting Southeast Portland and not only Southeast Portland, but all of Oregon and around the world as we support missions and missionaries. We thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for blessing us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Go ahead, ushers. Take up the offering. I love that. Jesus is the need meter. I, I want to be that person. Do you guys love Christmas season? How many of you love it? All right, and, and it's so excited. Look at Daniel's checking out. Well, he's looking at Dick Garcia. Okay, um, <laughs> you know what? This is a season where we just really have a great opportunity to seize our moments. You know, because when you're at the grocery store, there's just certain things you do in, in the month of December. There's cooking that you have to do that you don't do the rest of the year, right? There's shopping you do that you don't do the rest of the year. There's family that you do <laughs> that you don't necessarily do the rest of the year. <laughs> These are moments and opportunities for us to get to seize. And I love that. I love being in a line at a store that's ridiculously long and grumpy people are around me. Because then the light gets to shine. Amen. And then we will do what Dion said. We will look back and we'll go, look what Jesus did. That is so exciting. Don't you want, Je I want my life to be a testimony to me. 
I want to stand back at my life and go, dang, Jesus. <laughs> I, you are bigger and better than I thought. You know, it's going to be so awesome. Sometimes you look at other people's lives and expect him to do great things there. And, and do, but expect him to be awesome and amazing in your life too. Amen. 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 Uh, prayer is uh, youth this Tuesday Yay! night. Yeah! Am I allowed to say there's something happening? And we have guest speakers coming in on Tuesday night, right? And it's our, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Oh, they're preparing. Okay, well, they're coming from India. I like that, too, when you, when you prayed for Southeast and that we're having an impact here in Southeast Portland. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. It's also having an impact in, in Canby. It's yes. also having an impact in, in Beaver Creek. He's also having an impact in, in uh, Clackamas because yeah. wherever you go, there goes the impact. Yes, so that's so exciting. <laughs> I'm just doing the announcements. We have prayer on Wednesday night. No, Wednesday night is prayer at 7 o'clock, all right? We also have prayer on Sunday morning at 9.30, and uh, fantastic. Uh, potluck is next week. Yes. Okay, this is your December potluck. Let's bring it, you guys, okay? <laughs> um, and, and Chris should do the throwdown. She brings the best food, okay? All right. Oh, is he doing the cooking this time? Okay, all right. Maybe, can, 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 I, can we have a little competition next uh, week? If they walk in love. I'm all about it. <laughs> Let's just have a little competition. And, and you know, yeah, and, and, and we'll get a couple people to, and, and we will have some hidden judges that, they, you know, they're incognito, okay? And, and we'll have some judges, and we'll have, we'll have the best, uh, the best uh, main dish and the best dessert. Does anybody like, yeah, yeah? That's fine. <laughs> food what? is food. Yeah, whatever. Food is food, Daniel. <laughs> Go home and eat lettuce, okay? All right. So, and, and we will have prizes. Ooh. We'll have Money. prizes. Yeah. All right, all right. Shh, okay. So uh. next Sunday, okay, bring some awesome, amazing food. And, and it's fellowship. Fellowship is an opportunity for you to be the church and minister to all of us. It's so good. Um, and I hope I'm saying this correctly. Women on the December 17th, Victorian Bell. Is yes, it called it's the, Bell? It's, it is. It's the Victorian Bell House. It has Victorian a Bell lights. House. I didn't know. Him. Okay. I just have a few notes. Okay. So it's a house. House. I've never heard of it. So I should go because this looks exciting. This is great. <laughs> this is great. So do we need to, are we signing up somewhere specific? Not is there yet, somebody to see? They will be. Okay. All right. Um, and then December 29th, if you're married, go woohoo! Woo! Oh, come on. You guys waited so long to get married. Yes. All right. December 29th, uh, we're having a married uh, dinner at our house. And yes, we're going we're gonna to have you sign up. It's gonna, Steve is very, very excited. Okay, there you go. December 19th. One last thing December 19th is the youth Christmas party. Woo! You can say it, you're right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. As we come in to worship, let's just honor him and bless his name. Actually, I'd like us all to stand and sing Jesus at the center. Just put your thoughts and mind on him. Let it be the center. Jesus and the center.
declare you are Lord over all the youth ministries. We prophesy and we see the full and overflowing with passionate worship, with the love for the lost, with the strength that can stand, and a prophetic power to call forth the love of Jesus in the midst of the most dying situation. Thank you. 
Actually, we're just going to stop. We're going home now. Hey, we've, we've reached the pinnacle. Yeah. No, Sorry. we have not. No, not even close. Praise God. Wow. Wow. You guys are a great choir. I mean, you got a great worship team, but you're a great choir. Amen. Woo. Man, those are some great. Who picked those songs? Who picked those songs? Who picked those songs? I tell you what, we could, I'd burn up that, that, that other, what's that song? Love So Great? I'd play that every Sunday. But I'd burn it up, burn it out. You know, people go, Pastor Steve, we do this song every Sunday. But it's so great. It's such a great song. Well, I, I, I'm a little, I, I, wow. Oh, glory to God. I, you know, we were singing, God is so good. God is, you know, he's good. Is that song, he's good. I turned over, I went over to Dean, I said, yeah. do you ever get tired of saying that? And he's going, he's going man, I just, I'm just being real emotional right here. I mean, I just, I've got you all over me, you know. And that's, that's wonderful, yes. Something going, Something going on with my mic? You want me to use this? Is it working now? I mean, I can't, it doesn't matter. Okay. Oh, youth. You, yes, youth. Ten, ten, right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, youth, you have uh, your fire started, so please be a part of that. Yes, Matchbox. Go and... What's that? No. Yes. Hey, this is what, there's all kinds of confusion going on here. I don't, I don't need to use a, a mic. I need to get on to... Uh, uh, 
Okay, am I, am I, there we go. Okay. Leave that on. All right. Thank you, Fernando. Okay. Boy, your anointing was about to leave. <laughs> I, I talk about anointings. I went to prison on Thursday. Oh my gosh, Rich! Patty! Why did you do that to me? <laughs> Doggone! It was so awesome. I tell you, they've got a worship leader there. And he says he's going to come and visit us. But this guy is really, really anointed. I mean, he is an amazing worship leader there in the prison. No, no, I mean, this guy is good. I mean, I mean, he's God uses this guy. And, and then our services, I mean, these guys are just singing and they're just worshiping and they got their hands raised and they're, I mean, it's, you know, and, and, and so they turned it on. I said, I said, how long do I got, Rich? And, and, uh, and Rich said, a half an hour. And I go, I can do that. <laughs> and I went for a half an hour and I mean, I went full bore. Full bore. In fact, Sam heard, uh, or, uh, Gary said that, that he heard that I was on fire. And he said he didn't know if he wanted to touch me. I said, I'm just smoldering now. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay said I did a great job. Well, I, you know, I, it was, you know, I preached out of Second Samuel, or First Samuel, that the, the 400 men that came to David, they were distressed, in debt, and discontented. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, that's who God used, David's 400 men, and that's the kind of men he wants to use now. Amen. And, and I just said, the, the sermon was, who God uses. And I told these convicts, I said, God wants to use you. And guess what? He wants to use you too, whether you've been convicted or not. I tell you one thing, you've been convicted of sin. Yeah. So that makes you a convict. Yeah. Woo! And I also told them that you are invited and you are welcome to Southeast Christian Center. How many are willing, you know, you don't know when people come in here. You don't know whether they've been convicted of a crime or not. And what difference does it make anyway? You're looking at an ex-con, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> But they, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was an amazing night, truly an amazing night. And, uh, and we just look forward. I tell you what, I, I'm, I'm getting to know these guys on a, on a first name basis, and that's what really matters. And, and they ask, are you coming back? And I go, yeah, I'm here, man. I'm coming back. You know? And, and, uh, and this one guy, he, his name's Samuel. That's a good name. Yes, it is, Samuel. And... Uh, and Samuel, he, he, was, he came up and I said, Sam, I remember you from last week. He goes, you do? And I go, yeah, because of your smile. And he's got this big beaming smile. He's a big tall guy. You know, well, he's, probably, he's probably six feet. That's pretty tall for me. <laughs> but uh, no, he's tall. He's like 6'3 or so. But, uh, and and, and just, a, just a beaming guy, you know. And I said, I says, man, you know, you just got a great smile, you know. And God's, God's all over you. And, and he said, yeah. He says, he says, well, you pray for me. My wife is about to have a baby. And I'll be in here. Yeah. Amen. Father, we lift up Samuel to you right now. We thank you, Lord, that you are using him. And that, Lord, in this difficult time when he's not there to, to witness the birth of his child, that, Lord, he realizes that in your goodness, Lord, you will set him free from that place. And, Lord, he'll do his time. He'll pay to society what he owes them. And, Lord, that he understands and grabs a hold of the truth that, Lord, you paid the price for him. Yeah. You did time for him. And Lord, that he appreciates what you've done. And Lord, that while he's there, that he has family to take care of his wife. He has family, he, uh, that he has, uh, uh, you will provide for everything his family, his wife, his child needs while he's there. And he will see the goodness of the Lord and proclaim it to all those in and out of prison. Amen. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. So anyway, he, he came up to him. We were worshiping, and he, he came over. He was, he was across the kind of, well, I don't know if it's really an aisle, but, but a couple of chairs distance away. And he came over, and he said, you know, Pastor, you're really blessed. 
And I go, how's that? And he goes, I mean, look, your, your wife's leading the worship. Your daughter's up there singing. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you, you know you're really blessed and I go I, I got another one too and she's older he goes really I go yeah yeah she's a real pistol too I mean she's 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 awesome they're 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 wonderful I said but you know God is I, I give all he, I give him the glory I mean I, I don't you know he he deserves it I what you know I'm just trying to obey yeah. which leads us to the sermon <laughs> segue baby come on segue it pays to obey. Amen. It pays to obey. Now, Israel was in a bad place. They were in a bad place. And God uh, uh, would raise up different prophets to try and get them back to him. You know, that's the goodness of God. When people stray, he's always about getting them back. Amen. And so he sent prophets and one of the greatest prophets, probably in the Old Testament, without a doubt, is I guess he gets the most publicity because he has a great book, and that is Isaiah. There's more prophecies concerning the Messiah in the book of Isaiah than any other prophet. He's an amazing prophet. And God, uh, God uh, uh, spoke through him, and he said, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? That, isn't that, I mean, think about that. And God says, come on, come here, just sit down and let's talk about this. Because you're in a real mess and you need to get out of it. He, he, he didn't, you know what? God in all his goodness didn't have to send one prophet. He didn't. He just said, you know, I, it's just you, you, you're, you, you're uh, uh, wasting away in your sin and your rebellion. And uh, you know, I'm not even going to warn you. The Assyrians are coming and they're taking you away. I'm not going to tell you. This is going to happen. But no, in his goodness, he says, let's sit down. Let's talk about this. He says, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by this sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so the Bible has a lot to say about obedience. Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that we have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And Lord, we have this Old Testament and New Testament. But in the Old Testament, we have examples to show us how we can avoid being devoured by the sword. And so, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it has power. We thank you that it has the power to change our hearts and to serve you in a greater capacity and obey you in all things. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. So there's a lot of, it, it, we could go, I mean, and I'm, I'll get into some later, but there's a lot of examples of disobedience and, and obedience in the Bible. And I think, I, I thought, well, where could I start? Well, let's start with our first parents. It's a pretty good example. Amen? Pretty good example. Adam and Eve. And you know what? They only had one commandment. Just one. You would think, that's not too difficult. Just one commandment. Don't eat of the fruit of that tree. That's it. Everything is yours. Do whatever you want with it. Whatever you have. Just one thing. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. And they did. And we go, how in the world could they do that? How in the world could they do that? And then I thought about it. And I thought, I remember my parents saying, just don't do that. I remember one time when I was standing on a scaffold that my dad erected on the side of our house. And my brother told me, do not knock that board out. One commandment. <laughs> One commandment. Don't take that board out. Well, I'm tired of hearing all his commandments. And I took my hammer and I went whack. And that happened to be the last brace holding the scaffold up. And I was standing on the edge of the scaffold and all of a sudden it just went. And I just rode it out until it came right to the ground and then I jumped. I could have saved myself some pain. 
by obeying one commandment. Amen? But they did eat of the fruit of the tree. That's the sad part. They did eat it. Yet someone came and righted the wrong. Isn't that awesome? Somebody came and righted the wrong. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If I get through this, it's going to be a miracle. But my mom would always say, miracles never cease. Fine Catholic woman. Miracles never cease. She would always tell us that. Miracles never cease. Oh, miracles never cease. And then when I got saved, I went, she was right. <laughs> Therefore, Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him was to come. Jesus. So Jesus is a type of Adam. In, in the sense that Adam was born sinless. Amen. Yeah. Had no sin. Right. Adam and Eve had no sin. Jesus was born sinless. Adam was the firstborn son. Jesus is the first begotten, the only son of God. Amen. And then he goes on to say in this in verse 15. He says, but the free gift is not like the offense. There's a free gift. Isn't that wonderful? For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The gift. Think about what the gift is. In Jesus Christ, the gift consists of the gift of grace. <laughs> grace is a gift. You can't earn it. God gives it to us. Amen. And then there's the gift of righteousness. There's the gift of righteousness and there's the gift of eternal life. All wrapped up in the person of Jesus. See, he became for us. 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 30 says, he became for us righteousness, sanctification, wisdom. Amen. Amen. So our righteousness, and, and you know, it's interesting because I, I don't want to get on to righteousness, but, but uh, somebody came to me recently and, and asked me about a situation and, and said about sin and then said that we're all sinners. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. And, and, and I'm try, not trying to play word games here, semantics with us. But we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's Bible. Okay, that's Bible. If you ask, when, when I used to teach at, the, at, at, at Freedom House and, and, and Teen Challenge, uh, uh, and I would ask guys, uh, because so many people deal with uh, uh, poor self-image, uh, poor uh, perception of themselves, of what they, how they, they view themselves and how they think God views them. Yeah. And so I would ask them, how many, how many sinners do we have here? Almost every single one would raise their hand. <laughs> every single one. And I'm not going to ask you to do this, that, here. We are not sinners. Hallelujah. We are not sinners. Well, Pastor Steve, we sin. Yeah, but are you practicing it? Because if you're practicing it, then you need to get saved. Hello. Or you need to repent. Yeah. But the Bible says that we have received a gift called righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. It's not ours, but it's he gives it to us and he declares us right with him. That's what righteousness is. You're in right standing with him. We weren't before. We were separated from him, but now we're in, in him, in Christ. We are righteous. Now, do we sin? Yes, but that doesn't, that doesn't make you a sinner. We are we are saints. Paul never, ever, ever addressed the church as sinners. Yeah. Never. You, if you can find it, I'll eat your Bible. <laughs> he never called the church sinners. He called them saints. Yeah. He called them saints. He said, you know, we could go through it. He called them saints in Romans. He called them saints in Philippi. He called them saints in Colossae. He called them saints in uh, um, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. He, uh, all those books, he addressed them as saints. What's that mean? You think, now what I grew up in, a saint was somebody that had to get canonized by the Pope. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. A saint simply means in New Testament, he's been separated. Hello. You've been called out. 
And we have been called out of the world and into Christ. And Christ, Christ is our righteousness. And it is a gift. You can't earn it, but it's yours. If you want to receive it, it's yours. When you receive Jesus, you receive that. You receive the righteousness. So, we are saints who do sin. But we are not sinning saints. God forbid. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But understand that you are, don't, don't look at yourself in this light that, uh, listen, a guy came to our youth, he was a magician, and he, and he, he, he years ago, and he, and he did his act and everything, we had him on one of those crazy overnighter things, and he kept calling himself a filthy rotten sinner saved by grace. And he told me he went to this Baptist church and everything, but, but he had never told me that part, right? So, and, and, and he was a believer. I mean, he loved Jesus. But he kept telling my youth, I'm just a filthy, we're just filthy, rotten sinners saved by grace. And the next, the next time I had a youth meeting, I gave them a little discussion on the fact that they are not filthy, rotten sinners. Hello. Good grief. That's what I was. Yes. Yes. That's not what I am now. Amen. Now I am a, I am a, I know it sounds like, to me, it took me, listen, it took me to get my mind renewed to the fact to, that I could call myself a saint. In fact, it, it, I would never in a thousand years say that in front of my family. Because they don't, they have, their perception of saint is somebody that, that's been canonized that people pray to and have prayed to and their prayers have been answered by praying to this saint and it's just wrong. It's idolatry. Okay, so I, it, it took me a while to understand, first of all, it means to be separated. Yeah. We were in the kingdom of darkness, but we're out of it, and we're in the kingdom of light. And so now we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing, and all you got to do is just claim it. Just claim it. Say, I am. And you know what? The more you say it, and the more you claim it, the less you walk in sin. Because you realize, you know what? I'm not going to do that. That's sinful. That's not what, that's not what saints do. So I'm not going to do that. And one of the first things I did is I quit cussing. Yeah. You cuss, Pastor Steve? Oh, mercy. And you know, the worst part about my cussing was Jesus' name was in it. Mm-hmm. A lot. But when, I, when he saved me, I went, oh, it's just right away I knew, oh my gosh, that name means something. Amen. I mean, that name has done something on the inside of me. And I love singing about that name. And I, I, I just about blew my voice out here this morning. Because I don't know if I'm singing or screaming. The screamo pastor. Daniel does screamo. He does it really well. Verse 16. Verse 16. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For judgment came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, Jesus Christ himself, which came from many offenses resulted in justification. There's another wonderful word. Yes. My gosh. You know, you, these, these theological terms. See, I love theology. I, I love doctrine. I love God. I love I, you know, I just, th these are wonderful things when you study them. And justification is that God, it's a, it's a legal term, that God has wiped off the record of every offense you did and he says you're okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's as though you never ever sinned. Like That's what justification is. Just as if you never had. As, it, that, though your sins were as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Like it's amazing. That he can do that for us. So one man's offense brought death. Another man's death. And one man's death brought. In verse eight, 17. Did I give 17? No. For by one man's offense death reigned through the one. Much more those who received abundance of grace. Who's received abundance of grace? Right here. And of the gift. The gift of righteousness. See you, you didn't earn that. That was given to you. And that's why you ought to shout. Hallelujah. That's why we ought to praise him. That's why we ought to sing. A a or do something that, that sounds like singing. <laughs> and and, and the, the gift of righteousness will reign in life. You will rule. I rule in this life through Jesus Christ. I reign through him. Amen. He's my conqueror. 
He's my conqueror. I overcome sin. I can't even list all the junk that I overcame. Through him. I reign in life through him. It's amazing. And then he says this. He says, so one man's offense brought death. One man's death brought an abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, and ruling and reigning in the life we have. Now look at verse 19. For by one man's of, oh, disobedience, here we go. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, all, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Well, you say, well, Pastor Steve, I thought you said we, we are the righteousness. Well, you will be made righteous when you receive him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's when you receive it. Mm -hmm. When you receive him, you receive the gift of righteousness. Isn't that amazing? We were through Adam's uh, disobedience, and you go, well, I would have never done that. Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you would. Because you've had your opportunity not to, and you did. <laughs> And you made, and, 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 and then we were, we, were made, we were made sinners through Adam, but then we were made righteous through Jesus Christ. It's this, it's this wonderful uh, picture of, of this horrible thing going on on this side, but then this other one coming over here and changing everything. Hallelujah. By obedience. By obedience. See, Jesus' obedience to the Father was to our benefit. Isn't that awesome? Jesus, pay, it paid. He is the example to us that it pays to obey. See, if he hadn't obeyed, if the Father said, it, it says in, in Hebrews, that uh, 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 in prophetically from, from the Old Testament, he says, prepare a body for me. And, and the Father said to Jesus in heaven, said to the Word, go, become flesh. Take on their sin because they can't, they, they can't pay for it. They're all lost, every single one. Would you go? No, I ain't going to do it. Leave them alone. Let them all perish. Let them all perish. Start over again like you did in Noah's day. No, no. Jesus said, sure, give me a body. I'll go. Isn't that awesome? pays to obey. Because he showed me that there's a blessing in obeying if I do the same thing. See, it's, there's always a blessing in obeying. There's, well, in Deuteronomy, it talks about the curses for disobeying. And all the disobedience that Israel did, all those curses came upon them. Every single one. He did it for us and we do it for him. Why? Because we love him. Because I love him. Yeah. I mean, you know, with my parents, I, you know, I, I didn't know when I was a little guy, but I love my mom and dad. So when they asked me to do something, I did it. Almost 100%. There's a couple times I didn't. <laughs> In fact, Jesus said, Jesus said, a sign of our love is obedience. Yeah. That's the sign. And look at Luke 6.46. Luke 6.46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. And he goes and he tells the story. He gives the parable of the, the, the one founded who's, who's, the one who hears and does. So the one who's a not just a hearer but a doer. And the one who is just a hearer and not a doer. And one is built on rock, a solid foundation. So saying is, does, is not a foundation. Doing is the foundation. And if you, if you love him, then we will do. I know it never gets a, a, a big yell, but, but it's true. It's true. And then John 14, 15. I love these here, these, these ones in John. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love him, keep his commandments. And then 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, 
Okay, that's keeping is doing. Okay, keeping is doing. So he who has my commandments keeps them. It is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So the more that we obey the word and the things that the word is telling us, the more he manifests himself to us. And that manifestation comes in all kinds of ways. But one way that it comes is he just shows us more and more how much he loves us. And we go, God is good. And we just keep going, God is good. Why is he good? Because when I obey, he blesses me. If you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. If you just be willing and obedient. And then in John 4.23, uh, uh, he says, And Jesus answered and said to him, He who loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. We will come to him. And we will make our abode or our, abode, or our home with him. So again, he's speaking to the future that the Holy Spirit would become and he would be resonant in us. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the, words which you, which, the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So that's really revelation there. That everything that Jesus said about loving him and keeping the commandments came from God himself. Amen. Came from the Father. And here's a, you know, here, here's a, uh, oh, there, one more. 1 John 2. This one is, uh, th th this, this scripture here can, can really rattle your cage. And, but you know what? There are some things in the Bible that we just go, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I've dealt with situations with people and, and, and you know, it's especially in, in, the, in the area of immorality. And they just, they go, well, I just don't know if I, you know, I just, I just, I just can't go along with that. Look at, it's just like in, it's just like we were talking about the, the whole homosexual issue. What is the problem? The church is caving in and they were, they're caving in and they're going, well, you, 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 it's amazing. I mean, 63% of people think it's okay. And I'm thinking, how many of those are believers? And they're going, well, they really love each other. No, no, that's not the criteria. Okay, God just said, it's, it's not, it's, it's wrong. It's just wrong. And you know, I heard a guy the other day, and I said this, should I go this, should I go there? Well, he was, he was a, pa he was a pastor, and he was saying how churches will go, and I've, I've been guilty of it. And we'll go, you know, when you're talking about homosexuality, you go, you know, we love gay people. You know, we, we're, we're not against gay people. Okay, we love gay people. And I've said it here, and I've said I have a gay niece, and I do love her. But, and we will say that, but we don't say this. You know, I know some liars, and I love them. They're wonderful people. And you know what? I know some adulterers, and they're, they're wonderful people. I love the adulterers. And, you know, I know some thieves, and they're wonderful people. Now, we don't say that, do we? <laughs> But we say that about homosexuality in the churches. Why? Because we don't even realize it. The political persuasion has hit us and we didn't even see it. The, polit the, the, the left has, 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 has gotten to it. And, and the fact is, you know what? It's sin. It's just all it is. And we shouldn't glorify it at all. Any more than we would lying, stealing, taking God's name in vain. Anything that is contrary to his word. We just don't give glory to it. It's about bottom line. So I'm not going to give glory to it anymore. I'm not going to say that anymore because I, I, I mean, I got convicted. I mean, I'm sitting there listening to this guy and I'm like, ay, 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 that's me. But here's a something that will, that, that, that is a real litmus test. And I, and I saw this. In fact, this so arrested me when I heard this on the, uh, 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 on the radio or, or uh, MP3 that I was listening to. That I had to pull over my car and write it down. You will not know a Christian, including myself, by how much they obey. But what they do when they disobey. Do they repent? Do they repent? See, we all miss it, folks. We've all missed it. We all find times where we disobey. What do we do when we disobey? 
do we ask God to forgive us or do we just keep going down that road of disobedience? Because ultimately it will cost us. Amen? And look at, let's look at Jesus' example again. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. I mean, I, I can't think of anybody else that's a better example of who to follow when it comes to obedience than Jesus himself. Hebrews 5, 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself, become high priest. But it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, supplications, was able to save him from death. Wait, wait. With vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And you think, well, how could the Son of God learn obedience? Well, how does any son or daughter learn obedience? By the experiences of life. You know, when we were kids, dinner was 5.15. You had to be in there, in the house, at the table. No, you couldn't get in the house. You had to be at the table at 515. And if you weren't, but my dad would always say, it, it, and he said, bread and water. That's all you're getting. Bread and water. If you're late, bread and water. And we thought he was serious, so we were always on time. We were always on time. And then, you know, my mom didn't mess around. If you weren't there at five, my, 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 no, my mom doesn't mess around. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story about my mom the other day. I'm driving her to the doctor's, and she said, now I want you to go this way. I want you to go down here, down by the, uh, uh, what is that, water tower in Milwaukee, and then you take a left on that street there, and I go, you know what? I'm tired of you. I'm tired of going with your directions. I want to go where I want to go. And she goes, tough. <laughs> I was just, I was just joking with her. But she goes, tough, take a left. <laughs> 92 and full of vim and vigor, boy, I'm telling you what. I mean, we'll be at the dinner table there. We go out to, on, on Wednesdays and we'll be at the dinner table and we're talking or something. She's trying to get my attention and finally she'll just go, Steven. I go, what? And she goes, shut up and listen to me. <laughs> But you know, I learned some other things from, from life experiences. One time I was sitting at the de at, at downstairs in the, in the uh, basement and the three of us were watching TV, my mom, my dad, and myself. And I'm so thankful my brothers and sisters weren't there. And my mom, I was like 12 or 13, had a real smart mouth. I was, you know, just in that age. And, and she asked for the TV guide. And I took the TV guide and I just kind of threw it over there at her. And you know that... Um, you know the, when, a, when a, uh, a fighter pilot pulls the cord and the, he's ejected out of, the, uh, uh, out of the plane? That's what I thought happened to my dad. He flew out of the chairs like, whoa, he's coming. <laughs> and he, he just grabbed me out of the chair and he threw me down on the floor and he pummeled me. And I got up like a whoop dog because I was whooped. I mean, he really... And I, you know what? I learned obedience from that. I did. I never threw anything at my mom again. Ever. One time I told her to shut up. It never goes well. She grabbed me by the ear and she just took me, she took me into the, into the uh, uh, bathroom and she grabbed a bar of soap and she said, open up your mouth. And I go, no. And so she just took it and she just rubbed it across my teeth. I, I, I should have opened it. I should have. It would have been much easier on my tongue. So I had, I, I had to brush my teeth for a, a, an hour just to get all the soap out of it. <laughs> it pays to obey. Yeah. Now, when it comes to Jesus, remember, he's all God and he's all man. He's all God and he's all man. As God, he needed to learn nothing. 
He's God. He knows everything. But as a man, he has to learn. And he learned by walking. He learned by faith, walking the earth. He did what he did by faith, folks, as a man. Everything he did, he had an anointing on him. He had the spirit without measure, but he still operated as a man. Teaching and showing us, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. You can, touch, you can t touch lives just like I've touched lives. In fact, I want you, I want just like Dion was saying, or Chrissy was saying, both of them. You guys are awesome, by the way. Man, was that a good word on giving? And Miss Christy? That's wonderful. It's so good to have them. He's my, they're my only friends. But he... You are too, Mark. But in his earthly walk, he lived by faith in the Father's will. So he still operated as a man, and he operated by faith, and he did his Father's will. Look at John 5.30. I can do nothing, I myself can, I do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so think about it. I'm not, Jesus is doing the Father's will. Everything he hears, everything he told us, everything he did, the healing, the casting out the devils, everything, it's because God told him to do it. He was obeying. And John 6, 38. John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will. Yeah. But the will of him who sent me. Amen. That's obedience. He learned obedience. Jesus had a man, as a man had to experience what men experience. Otherwise he couldn't be that high priest that could, that could uh, um, uh, sympathize with us. See earlier in chapter 5 uh, there in Hebrews. It talks about a high priest that is appointed among men. Jesus was appointed as a high priest by God under the order of Melchizedek. I'm not going to get into that. You read it, study it. It's wonderful. But, but he had to, he became human so that he could, he could understand us. Amen. He could understand us. Jesus knows our human frailty. He knows it well. He knows that, that before he prayed, before he went to the cross, when he was in Gethsemane, he knew, man, I, this is going to be tough. Because he undoubtedly had seen the Romans crucify people on Golgotha. He'd seen it. And he knew, it's oh man, that's, it, it, Lord, your will, not mine. Because if I, you know, as a man... He was torn. But he knew I'm obedient. See, Philippians says that he was obedient to the point of death. Even death of the cross. His, in his humanity, it was like, oh man, this is going to be ugly. And not only that, the crucifixion and the whipping, the beating, he knew all of that was coming. But he, said, but he also knew the worst thing that he was going to have to experience was the sin of the world. All that beating, all that whipping, we, we, yeah, it's horrible, it's terrible. But other men had suffered that and worse. People have suffered worse than the crucifixion. You think about it, you read, let's see, you read stories of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I mean, people had their skin flailed off of them, taken off of them alive. You know, that's painful. I mean, you get a little scrape off your, you know, ow. And, and tear, but nobody suffered the suffering that Jesus suffered by taking on the sin of the world. He didn't even know what it was. And when that was placed on him, it was so uh, uh, um, powerful in his life that he, he said, all of a sudden, when it came, the presence of God was gone. That he'd all, always known as a child. And the Holy Spirit came when, when he was anointed of the Holy Ghost at, at, at John's baptism. And all of that. And knowing the Father, hearing the Father, having that communication that they had. Knowing what to do, what not to do. 
All of that. And then in one millisecond of time, sin came into his life. And he said, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> it was ugly. But he did it. He was obedient even to the point of death. Jesus knew, Jesus knows hurt. Jesus knows pain. Jesus knows rejection. And a lot of people suffer rejection. I mean, I think about a guy that we recently was with and, and you know, he, he, he never really, his dad wasn't in his life. He has, a, he, he suffers from a for, some, some poor self-esteem issues. And we had, a, we had something be, between the two of us and I said, are, are we okay with it? He says, you know, I just, you know, I've had so many people leave me. And I said, okay, I get it. Well, I'm never going to leave you, okay? So, Jesus knows what it's like for people to leave him. He had undoubtedly hundreds of followers. And after about the second year and a half, they all started leaving. Everybody started leaving. And then up to the day that he died, the men that he was closest to, they all left him. Everybody. So he knows rejection. And he knows temptation. He knows the lure of sin. He knows what it's like. That's why he's the best high priest there is. We can go to him. We can talk to him. And he'll be there with us. And he, in, ver in chapter uh, 5, verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with, with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and he was heard. God heard his prayer, and he raised him from the dead. Isn't that awesome? He heard his prayer and he raised him from the dead. Now, did he die? Yeah, he died, but it was temporary. Because he was obedient to go to the cross. And then in verse 8, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Here's a great lesson about uh, in suffering and, and, and in love. How many of us have been wronged? Hello. How many of us have, how many, how many have somebody speak ill of you and you know that what they said was not only wrong, but you were innocent? I mean, I've been there. Now, how many of us have said things that we shouldn't have said? And, you know, <laughs> yeah. No. I see that hand, Dick. And, and uh, but, but listen, here's the cool, the, the Bible's in the first description of love in in Rome in first Corinthians 13 it says love suffers long first one first one love suffers long it's the first description and Jesus in his obedience he suffered long Okay, I mean, I remember when I was a, a real, real young believer and, and I was just reading through the Gospels and Jesus in Mark, I think it's Mark 5 or Mark 9, and he goes, how long shall I put up with you? And I'm thinking, up until that point, I'm thinking, you know, Jesus is so wonderful. He's just so nice and friendly and, and all that. And, and he's just, he's wonderful. And, and I'm going, I'm thinking, I'm reading the Bible. I'm, I'm really young in the Lord. And I go, geez, Lord, you're kind of rough, aren't you? I mean, that's kind of rough on, you know. How long should I put up? You know, how long do I got to put up with you? And then, but, let's not forget, he was a man. He was a man. And he realized, dang, I got a bunch of knuckleheads around here. <laughs> They're not getting it, McFly. And then as I grew in the Lord, and I was like, Lord, why are you putting up with me? <laughs> now I got it. Now I get it. But he suffered long. He suffered long with the disciples. He suffered long with the Pharisees. And he just held in there and never gave up on them. They gave up on him, but he never gave up on them. Amen. Let's close with this. Verse 9. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now that's a tough scripture. You think about that. But that flows perfectly in what Jesus said in the Gospels and what Paul says in his letters. You know, 
I just can't call him Lord and then live a life that is totally contrary to the word of God. I can't do it. And, and, and contrary to his word, contrary to his will, and think that I'm just going to get away with it. He doesn't see anything. There's no consequences for it. No, there is. In fact, the Bible in, in Hebrews, uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews, it warns of falling away. Yes, falling away. Now, I'm not talking about backsliding. That's not, that's not, what, that's not what Hebrews warns about. Hebrews warns about apostasy. You say, can people really do that, Pastor Steve? Well, you know what? Paul said in Thessalonians that there would be a falling away. That the church, there would be a falling away out of the church before Jesus comes back. And we're seeing it all the time. It's, it's happening more and more. And, and you, you, you hear of people, I mean, uh, I think the, the one that really shook the church here a while back was when Carlton Pearson. He just, I mean, he to went totally against Every known scripture concerning hell, concerning grace, concerning just about everything. And I'm only saying this because it's public record. I'm not pointing him out. But I mean, he just, it, it's sad. I mean, I was at his church in Tulsa and it was a powerful place. And, and uh, now that what he speaks, he just, he speaks at very liberal, liberal churches. And he talks about that, he, you know, he's a, he's a universal reconciliationist that, uh, uh, that, um, well, no, he's a universal Unitarian. He believes that all will be saved. Nobody's going to hell. Nobody. There is no hell. There's no eternal punishment. None of that. So that's just, uh, you know, talking about falling away. But he, he warns, in fact, in Hebrews, there's five warnings of falling away. And one such is found in the next chapter there in chapter 6. And I'm not going to go through it all, but he just talks about those who have heard the word, tasted of the word, they've, they've, they've uh, uh, known the Holy Spirit, and then, and then they fall away. That's not, a, that's not a, a backsliding. That is apostasy. People literally deny the Lord Jesus Christ whom they did believe in. Sad. You think, how does that happen, Pastor Steve? I guess the, wrong, the, the, the only thing I can think of is that it's seeds that create belief. Amen? The word of God is like a seed. And if you get, if you're not strong in the word and you start getting the wrong seed and you let that continually and you feed that you water that seed the next thing you know I mean people come out and they say I, just, I don't believe Jesus is God I mean we know a lady I mean she went from being a messianic Jew to being a orthodox Jew and she doesn't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah I mean, we're talking deception, total deception. And so Paul said, or not Paul, but because we don't know who wrote Hebrews. But he went on to say about, he's talking about this falling away. But I love what he says in verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? He said, he's warning them, but he says, you know what? The writer says, but I'm confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work, your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You're still doing it. Keep it up. You're not going to fall away. You're pressing in. You're pressing on. You're being obedient as the Savior was. Keep it up. And he says, and we desire that each of you show the same diligence. The same diligence. Constant, steady effort. That's what diligence is. Constant, steady effort. Keep pressing in. Keep following him. Keep obeying to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you do not become sluggish. No sluggards. No sluggards. Pastor Steve was a sluggard. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God, that is a good scripture. Isn't that? That's such a good scripture. I mean, you're believing God for something. But God, what's going on? Faith has to have patience. It has to. Because what happens is if we look, if we're always looking, where's it coming? When's it coming? When, now, now you're out of faith. Have faith. God said it. 
It'll happen. His word, I have the promises. I'm claiming it. It's mine. Now I'm just wait. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to rest. The rest of faith, that's a whole other topic. So, who's he talking to here? He's talking to those who have it in their hearts to obey. Because it pays to obey. Amen. You're going to get that in you. Well, again, we're all getting it in us. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you see us. That, that we would see ourselves as you see us. That we're not like those, Lord, who are wanna, who would fall away. But Lord, we want to press in. We want to know you. And we want to see the, 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 the example of, of our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. That he was obedient in the things he suffered. And Lord, what a wonderful example he is of, uh, to us. And Lord, that it pays to obey. Lord, there's blessings overflowing to us. Because, and we do it, Lord, not because you're going to hammer us if we don't. We do it because we love you, Lord. Yes. We love you. You're good to us. Yes. Jesus made up for every transgression that Adam committed. He paid the full price. And he showed us that it does pay to obey. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. What you'll continue to do in us. You are good. We glorify you. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Glory to God. Remember, next week we have potluck. Now,